Well, as I mentioned, uh, we are looking at Jesus' life, and we're looking at it right now through the lens, broadly, of the, uh, the Ten Commandments. Because if I were to ask you, did Jesus keep the Ten Commandments, what would you, what would you say? <laughs> yes, of course He did. Well, if He did, so are we. We're supposed to do it as well. So we, we're looking at how Jesus did this. And to do that, of course, we have to understand what the commandment actually is telling us. So we will spend a little bit of time on that. So we're going to be looking at the second commandment this morning, Exodus 20, verses 4 through 6. And I want to focus mainly on the commandment, but we don't, we don't want to forget about the blessings that are also here that are mentioned, that are attached to this, to this particular commandment. Okay, so again, the Lord wrote these commandments on tablets of stone with his own finger the first time. I think the second time Moses had to chisel it out after he uh, broke the tablets when he saw what Israel had done. We're actually going to look at, at uh, what they did um, in, in this message. But this is what God says, you shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath, or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. And notice that last one, that last blessing is attached to all the commandments, not just to the one. Uh, let me just say quickly, because uh, that, that can be a little bit confusing, what does it mean that God visits the, the iniquity of the fathers on the children? Because he says elsewhere in Scripture that, oh, you know, he was reproving the Jews for their saying, you know, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are on edge. In other words, the fathers have sinned and the children are, are facing the consequences for it. God says that he doesn't punish the children for their father's sins. So what does he mean here? that he's going to visit the iniquity of the fathers on the children. Well, I think what it means is that if you have an unfaithful and ungodly parents, that their children are going to suffer the consequences by God not really showing his mercies to them, as he promises that he will to those who actually do love him and keep his commandments. Okay? So there are consequences for those who raise their children in ungodliness, the consequence of not bringing God's blessing on them. And then this promise of showing loving kindness to thousands, he's talking about thousands of generations. Now, we need to understand that doesn't mean that, that all of our offspring, all of our children are going to be saved. That would be wonderful it did, if it didn't mean that. But if that were the case, as um, I've heard John Gerstner say, the entire human race would be saved because Adam and Eve were, were redeemed by the Lord, but not all, not all of their children were, were saved. So, but it does mean that God will visit those generations. Sometimes he will save all the children, sometimes just some, sometimes none, but it will continue down thousands of generations if we love the Lord and we are faithful to Him. But let's focus mainly on the commandment itself. Now, so far we've seen that God loved us first in eternity and He gave His Son to save us. He has shown His love for us. He gave us a Son not only um, to save us from our guilt, not only to become a curse for us, that, although that is very, very important. And he did that, of course, by obeying the law of God and by dying on the cross, which is what the Lord's table reminds us of. But as I've been emphasizing in this um, um, service so far, he did this that we might also love God, that we might love him as Jesus loved him. Jesus is that perfect example of how we are to love God. He is the example of the obedient son, and the Lord wants us to be obedient children. We know that Jesus, his heart was to keep the law of God, the law that shows us how to love. So again, that's what we're to be aiming at. That was God's goal, not just to save us from the punishment but to save us from the power of sin and to make us like Christ. Now, three weeks ago, we were looking at how Jesus kept the fifth commandment, how he honored his heavenly father and how he honored his earthly parents and loved them and respected them and listened to them. And we saw that. And two weeks ago, which was the last time we were in this series, we saw how he kept the first commandment, 
which says, You shall have no other gods before me. How he worshipped and served the true God. He did that from Sabbath to Sabbath. Every Sabbath he was in the synagogue worshipping with God's people. He spent time with him daily in prayer, in meditating on the scriptures, in, in singing praise to God. And he lived every moment of his life for the glory of God, seeking his pleasure in the Father and not in the things that are of the world. You know, our temptation is to seek our, our pleasure here. But Jesus found it in, in his Father, and that's where we need to find it. And the one thing that um, R.C. brought out, which I thought was, was very interesting, because of the purity of Jesus' heart, because of his obedient life, he lived each moment in the light of God's countenance, you know, that blessing that's pronounced uh, through the Aaronic priesthood upon the people of God, the Lord bless you and keep you, the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you, the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Jesus experienced that every single day of his life because of the purity of his heart and because of his obedient life before the Father. So he saw the face of God. He lived in the, in the light of that face. And of course, that's the face that was turned away when he was on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But this is our goal, to have that kind of heart, to have that kind of life so that we can live in that light. And I think if we've, you know, if we've experienced the Christian life long enough, we know that when we're not obeying God, we, we know when we fall into sin, things get dark. We don't feel like God is near. Uh, we feel like, as some have said, you know, the heavens have, have become brass over us and our prayers cannot reach the Lord. And we just don't sense that desire for Him any longer. It's, that is just the opposite of what we want. But when we're walking with the Lord, we do sense His nearness and His blessing. That's what we should be after. And that's what Jesus experienced. That's, that's what we want to experience as well. Now, this morning, let's consider how he kept the second commandment, okay? Now, we have to make a distinction here, and that's, that's what I, um, I want to focus on first of all. We need to make a distinction between the first and the second commandments because they're not saying the same thing. Now, he kept the first commandment by devoting himself to God. God was his God, the true God. And Jesus, as a man, worshiped the true God, even though he himself was God in human flesh. But he kept the second commandment by allowing that devotion to be shaped by God's Word, by living according to His Word. Now, we want to see how we get that out of the second commandment. So the second commandment, first of all, is all about how to worship God, how we are to do it. The first commandment is God is the God we are to worship. The second commandment is how do we do it. So let's read it again. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And then he goes on with the sanctions, you know, the blessing and the curse and so forth. Now, again, this is not simply a repetition of the first commandment. It's not a, another prohibition against worshiping false gods, though it certainly would do that. But we need to understand God doesn't waste words. Even when he's being repetitious, they're still not wasted words. This is his instruction on how he will be worshipped, stated negatively. Okay? You shall not. Well, you shall not what? Make an idol or any likeness. Now, again, we understand in the history of the church, there have been different understandings of this passage, and some have misunderstood it. Uh, the Roman church combines it with the first commandment, making it a further prohibition against idolatry. And that's how they justify their use of images. I mean, you ever wonder, how can they read the second commandment and have all the images that they have in, in, in their churches, particularly images of Christ? Well, that's how they do it. They're saying that you're not to make images of false gods and worship them, um, but you can make an image of the true God, the Lord Jesus Christ and His human nature, and you can worship that. And of course, you know, they go even beyond that, but we don't have time to get into that. Now, the, that's the Western church. Now, the Eastern church believes that this commandment really only prohibits the making and worshiping of 
three-dimensional images. Have you ever heard of icons? How many dimensions does an icon have? It technically has three, but they, they only see two. It's, you know, a picture, it's a flat picture. It's only, you know, length and width. It doesn't have depth, okay? Well, they say, this commandment says, don't make three-dimensional graven images and worship them, but you can make two-dimensional images and you can worship them. And so they do show respect to their icons, which are fancy pictures, very ornate pictures. I sadly knew someone who... Uh, fell away and went into the Eastern Church and became a worshiper of icons, and then he invited a mutual friend to come and kiss the icons with him. And uh, when, um, <laughs> when he couldn't do that, sadly, this man who was actually a seminary student along with me, and I think in maybe one year ahead of me, uh, he said, I can't, you, you, we can't be friends, we can't fellowship. If you can't kiss my icons, you know, then you can't, you can't you're not my brother. Well, again, a misunderstanding of this passage. We're not to worship pictures. We're not to worship three-dimensional images. Now, some in the Protestant church have taken this a little bit too far. You might be surprised to discover that some believe that this commandment, they believe that God is prohibiting the making of images, period, for any reason at all. In other words, I can't draw a picture of you. I can't take a picture of you. I can't even make a map, you know, or use Google Maps, you know, to find my way around with, with GPS. That would be sin. But I want you to notice here, first of all, that, that all of these are mistaken with regard to their understanding. God, God is not saying we can't make images. What he is saying is, uh, well, by the way, we, we know we're not to worship false gods. That's certainly true. But the images that he is forbidding here, first of all, are those that are made for the purpose of worship. He says, you shall not worship or serve them. Now, I want you to remember, secondly, that he has already prohibited us in the first commandment from having any other gods before him, which means in his presence. We're not to have God and other gods, but that's, that's exactly what Israel did. They said they were worshiping the true God, but they also worshiped Baal and Asherah because they wanted to cover their bases. They wanted to make sure they got the rain. They wanted to make sure their animals bore. They wanted to make sure they were able to have children, so they covered all the bases. Well, God says, you shall not do this. So this is not a repetition of that, okay? What he's forbidding here is the use of images to worship him, okay? To worship him. Now again, think about why God might have to give them such a commandment. Well, remember what was going on in Egypt, that the Egyptians were worshiping their gods through images. Remember what, what was happening in the land of Canaan, the land to which they were going. They were doing the same thing. The nations around them were doing the same thing. As a matter of fact, all the peoples of the earth we're doing exactly this. Remember what Paul writes in Romans 1, verses 21 through 23, which is a commentary on the human race. For even though they knew God and they could see him through the creation, God makes himself quite plain. They did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. You know, I think one thing we don't often understand is when we see people worshiping stone and wood and rocks and things like that, they're not worshiping. I mean, they, they actually are worshiping those metals and materials, right? But they think they're actually worshiping a God that is greater than that, that maybe inhabits that, or maybe this is a likeness of that, but they're worshiping something greater than these things. But they're worshiping their God through these images. And this is what mankind does. It's been universally true throughout the history of mankind. Well, the true God, the one who is invisible, the one who is infinitely great, says he will not be treated in the same way. As a matter of fact, Moses tells us that this is precisely why God, when he appeared at Sinai, to give them the commandments did not appear in a visible form. Let me read to you Deuteronomy 4, verses 12 through 18. And you tell me, 
if that's what it's saying. Then the Lord spoke to you, this is Moses speaking to the people, the second generation about to go into the land where they're going to be tempted by idolatry. Then the Lord spoke to you from the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but you saw no form, only a voice. I'm going to read a little bit further. So he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded to you to perform, that is, the Ten Commandments. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone. The Lord commanded me at that time to teach you the statutes and judgments that you might perform them in the land where you were going over to possess it. Notice, so watch yourselves carefully. Since you did not see any form on the day the Lord spoke to you at Horeb, Sinai, from the midst of the fire, so that you do not act corruptly and make a graven image for yourselves in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the sky, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the water below the earth. Moses is saying God did not appear in a visible form so that you would not make an image of him, but don't make a, an image of anything else and try to worship him through that as well. Now, I think if you know your Old Testament history, you know that that's exactly what they did when they came out of Egypt. This is, I just read from Deuteronomy, and the people who did this who came out of Egypt are all gone, okay? But he's warning them not to do the same thing because they did exactly what the Egyptians were doing. So when Moses went up to the mountain to receive the commandments, we read in Exodus 32, verses 1 through 5, this is after they've come out of Egypt, Moses goes up to the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights fasting and receives the law of God, but then it takes a while, 40 days, that's a long time. So we read in Exodus 32, 1, Now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain... The people assembled about Aaron and said to him, Come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. Then all the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. Now, the one thing that we, I think we often um, understand this passage to be saying is that the Israelites came out of Egypt, they quickly abandoned God and began worshiping a false, you know, a false idol, a golden calf. But that's not actually what happened. They, they didn't see all these miracles, even passing through the Red Sea and God's marvelous deliverance, only to abandon Him so quickly. What they were trying to do here was to worship Him through an image. Because I want you to notice what what they said. This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Well, what God was that? That was the true God. And by the way, they use the word here, Elohim, which is, you know, the, it's the Hebrew plural of the word El, which means God, and it is often used of the true God. And then notice what Aaron said. Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. Now, that's unmistakable because the word Lord there is the covenant name of God, Yahweh. What they were doing here was representing God as an animal. And let's not forget how God responded to that. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, they are an obstinate people. Now then, let me alone that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them, and I will make of you a great nation. Now we know that if Moses had not stood in the gap and interceded, which is a picture of what the Lord Jesus Christ does for us, he stands between us and God and it's his intercession that keeps us in the grace of God. If it wasn't for Moses' intercession, the Lord would have destroyed them. Now think about this for a minute. What if somebody offered to make, let's say, a, a, <clears throat> a statue of you, 
<laughs> and when they got done, they brought you a, a statue or a, you know, of, a, of a calf or of some kind of a, of a creepy crawling thing or you know, they, they, they made you less than what you are. I mean, how would you respond to that? Would you feel kind of slighted? Well, how much more would the infinite, invisible, and infinitely worthy God feel when he is being represented by some one of his creatures? What the Lord here is saying is we are not to worship him through images. Now, let's go a little bit further. That's one thing we're not to do. But another thing we're not to do, equally clear in Scripture, and again, an extension of this commandment is God is, is the one who is telling us how he'll be worshipped. We're also not to be innovative. You know, add things to the worship of God simply because of something we might like to do. I don't know if you remember we were hearing Dr. Godfrey talk about how church has become either a temple or a theater. You know, a temple that's great and ornate and has all these images in it and you feel holy just because you're in there or a theater where people come to be entertained. That's innovation. That's not what God desires. He, he desires that we worship Him in spirit and in truth. Well, we do have an example. We have actually a couple of them in Scripture, but let me just give you one of what happened to God's people when they became innovative in their worship. And that's what happened to Aaron's sons. You perhaps remember this. Uh, they were priests. And we read in Leviticus 10, verses 1 through 3, Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective firepans, and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And, and what happened? And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, it is what the Lord spoke, saying, by those who come near me, I will be treated as holy, and before all the people I will be honored. So Aaron therefore kept silent. Well, this tells us anything. It tells us that God, when he says, I want you to do this, that he wants us to do that and not to add other things. I mean, this strange fire, it, they offered some kind of an incense in a configuration that, that wasn't the kind that God had told them to offer him. Why they did it, why they would ever think about doing that, I have no idea. But when they did it, whether purposely or, or you know, ignorantly, the punishment was the same. So we're not to worship God through images, nor are we to add things to his worship. Okay? Rather, to state this positively, we are to worship him as he tells us, as he commands us. God knows what is pleasing to him. And he tells us what is pleasing to him. And so if we want to please him, all we need to do is just simply do it. Just worship the way he calls us to. And we're going to see how we, do, how we are to do that in just a moment. But let me just mention there is one other dimension to this commandment that we don't often think about. And that is, since all of life is to be worshipped to God, we need to live all of our life according to the will of God. That's exactly what Paul is talking about in Romans 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. And how do you do that? By the Word of God. Jesus speaks in the Word, and as He speaks, it has a transforming influence in our lives. We, we cannot expect to grow into the image of God unless we spend time in the Word. And not only that, but when we read it and we understand what it says, we need, by God's grace, actually to put it into practice. Now, remember what Jesus said to the devil when the devil tempted him to disobey his father and turn the stones into bread? Quoting Deuteronomy 8, verse 3, he said, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That really is the principle which is embodied in this second commandment, that our lives, all of which is to be worshipped, is to be governed by the Word of God. Now, that's, that's what the commandment is saying. Secondly, and briefly, let's, let's see that Jesus kept this commandment. 
Now, we don't always have explicit examples of Jesus keeping the commandments, but we do know this, that God gave these commandments, and we know that Jesus kept them, so we can, we can just go from that premise. He would never have violated his Father's commandments. But we do, we do know that Jesus kept this commandment in both ways. Now, last week we noted that he faithfully worshiped God by going to the synagogue every Sabbath. But in going to the synagogue, in the synagogue, he worshiped as God commanded. So I thought it would be interesting to look at synagogue worship just for a moment to see what, what it was composed of. So synagogue worship would begin with, with a confession of faith, Israel's confession, what's called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Now this was followed by prayer. You know, we, I don't know how long it took to get through all of these, but they had actually 18 prayers. And they would go through all 18 of them in every synagogue service. And the people, when they heard each one at the end, would say amen. So that was their participation. But let me read the first one. Blessed are you, the Lord our God, and the God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the great, the mighty, and the terrible God, the most high God who shows mercy and kindness, who creates all things, who remembers the pious deeds of the patriarch and will in love bring a redeemer to their children's children for your name's sake. O King, helper, savior, and shield, blessed are you, O Lord, the shield of Abraham. And all the people would say, Amen. You know, it's interesting about this redeemer that uh, they were saying the Lord would send probably still looking for a political redeemer rather than a redeemer from their sins in the same way Israel was when Jesus came. Now, after the prayers, there was the reading of the law and the prophets, and the law or the Pentateuch was divided into 154 sections so that it could be read systematically over a period of three years. They would get through all of it. And then after the law section of the prophets, and then a homily or a sermon based on one of those readings. After that, the congregation would sing psalms and worship would be concluded with a benediction. By the way, does that, does that at all sound familiar to you, this kind of order of worship that they had? The New Testament pattern of worship was patterned actually after synagogue worship. But the point is Jesus worshiped in this way because it was honoring to God. And he also worshiped God with his whole life. As we saw before, he served the Lord uh, and found his satisfaction in doing that. It was his food and his drink. And as he told the devil when he rebuffed him, that he lived by his father's every word. Okay, Jesus' whole life was that of loving worship. And that, of course, is what he desires of us. God loved us. He sent his son for us. He gave us the spirit in order that we might have the ability to follow Jesus' example, not, not just to mimic him, not just to imitate him, but to actually become like him. You know, this isn't something we, we're forcing ourselves to do utterly against our wills in order to, to, to gain God's favor. The Spirit of God gives us a love for God that makes us want to please God, and this is how we are to please him, and so we, we gravitate in this direction. So, if we are to be like Christ, we must also live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We need to do this in our public worship, by meeting together on the Lord's Day. You know, the Old Testament church met on the seventh day. That was the Old Testament Sabbath that commemorated the completion of the original creation. The New Testament church met on the first day of the week, the day that Jesus rose from the dead to commemorate His resurrection which was the completion of the new creation, which is what we're a part of through faith in Christ. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature, which means he is a part of that new creation in Christ. We are, as we gather together, confess our faith together in Christ, which is what we, we do. I mean, we see that in Paul, when Paul writes to Timothy, and again, we heard this through Dr. Godfrey. By common confession, 1 Timothy 3.16, great is the mystery of godliness, he who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, 
believed on in the world, taken up into glory. We confess Christ together. When we meet together, we meet to hear His Word and to hear an exposition of His Word. Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.13, Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. And of course, we also pray. Paul writes to the Thessalonians, we're to pray without ceasing. And we do that not only in public, but also in private. We do need to spend time with the Lord in prayer. We'll never become like Christ unless we are devoted to prayer. We also sing. Paul writes to the, to the Colossians in Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Now, how do you think we do that? Am I supposed to come up to you and, and sing a psalm or sing a song to you? Is that, are we supposed to be singing to one another in that way? Well, no. But when we sing and worship, that's exactly what we're doing. We are teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's how these hymns work. That's how these psalms work. They're sanctifying, and we need to sing them. We celebrate the Lord's Supper. Now, here's an interesting difference, right? Um, the Old Testament church celebrated the Passover once a year. And some well-meaning Christians have also thought that... Um, that means we should only have the Lord's Supper once a year. But we do see the early church celebrating the Lord's Supper frequently, I think on a week-to-week -week basis, because their gathering together, according to 1 Corinthians 11, was what Paul says, when you gather together, this is a negative example, but still an example, when you gather together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. And what he was saying by that was it should be, but it's not because you're abusing it. So their meeting together was to eat of the Lord's Supper. And we see that early on in Acts 2, verse 42. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. The breaking of bread here is not just having a meal together because it is the breaking of the bread, the specific, the definite bread, and that's used really in the New Testament only to refer to the Lord's Supper. We celebrate His death every week in the Lord's Supper, but we also celebrate His resurrection by meeting on the first day of the week. And then we also have a benediction. By the way, I, I did mention that they use the Aaronic benediction. We have several benedictions that we can use in New Testament worship. One of them comes from Philippians 4.23. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Okay, so the service ends with a benediction. So again, if we're to follow Jesus' example, we'll worship him not only on his day and do it in his way, but we'll also worship him every day with our whole lives, seeking to live by every word that proceeds from his mouth. That's more as, you know, looking at that to be more necessary for us than our daily bread. Again, even as our Lord Jesus did to show our love and our thankfulness to God. So God loved us that we may love Him as Jesus loved Him. And the more we do this, the more we'll experience what Jesus experienced, which is God's blessing. Even though the path is difficult, we'll still want to be on that path because it's there we experience the blessing of God. It's there we see the light of His countenance, of His blessed face. And so that's why, that's why we will walk on that path, because our hearts desire it and because of the pleasure we actually get from it. And this is what Jesus meant when He said in the Beatitudes, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, not just there, but also here. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's, um, let's pray that the Lord would strengthen us in our resolve to uh, worship Him in a way that's pleasing to Him with the whole of our lives according to His Word.